You're all very welcome to this event, um, which is built as a conversation between me and Malachi, but it's actually a conversation between all of us mm -hmm. and Malachi, which I will lead. Um, I am the Director of Community Engagement and Professor of Politics here. Um, and so the opportunity to have a conversation with Malachi in a formal setting is great. I should say that we live on the same street. <laughs> So we have informal conversations every now and again. Yeah, That's great. Yeah. Uh, at Christmas, exactly. Yeah. And um, so, uh, yeah. as Malachi said, that there's a risk that we will be too familiar and uh, be, it'll be not enough disagreement between us. So uh, just to make sure that if you have a disagreement or you want to raise a topic, please make sure that you do. And I'll try and make sure that this is as open a conversation as possible because I think it is a real opportunity to talk to Malachi about uh, this book, which, as John Alderdice said, is going to become essential reading for anyone who speaks about Ireland. There are uh, so many endorsements inside the book uh, from really people who know what they're talking about that it's actually a real tribute to the quality of the book. And having read the book now twice when it came out and then for the purposes of today, I think it really is. It, it reads really, really well because it brings you into a process of thought which is so well informed. So. I think this will be uh, good fun. Just to say, from a formal point of view, about Malachi, those of you who um, aren't aware, and I'm sure you mostly are, uh, Malachi's been one of the most uh, prolific commentators on Northern Ireland affairs from the journalistic side, really over decades now. Mm -hmm. um, but you've always, um, I suppose, spilled as well into the kind of academic in the sense that it's not formal academia, but nevertheless mm -hmm. engaging with academic topics. Um, and you've always been socially interested, uh, that you're interested in some of the impacts of the stuff, so the, the way in which journalism is a, a, a live thing rather than just for the journalist, it's a, it's a, a communication. So I think mm. that's been really important. Um, the list of books, now you must have become one of the most uh, widely uh, written authors, not only... <laughs> not the most widely written. Uh, I was going to say, well, well I don't know, you, you can tell me how many, but these books have all become parts yeah. of landscape. Uh, yeah. The Trouble with Guns, I think, in 98 was a major uh, piece of work. And mm -hmm. I think it actually set a tone. Yeah. And I think um, also the Year of Chaos that you wrote in mm -hmm. 2021 has mm -hmm. also kind yeah. of focused people's minds on just how serious events were in Northern Ireland in 1971, 72. And sometimes yeah. when you look at the reality, you wonder how we even are still sitting here. But we are. Mm -hmm. um, we're sitting here talking about, can Ireland be one? Um, you have been a journalist on radio, on print, um, but and in Ireland and beyond. So mm -hmm. uh, you do and bring also the sensitivity to international affairs. So I think it's a great opportunity uh, for this festival to have you here. So really, thank you, thank very, you much very much for coming. Uh -huh. In terms of format, um, we thought that the first thing I would do is just ask Maliki just to read a bit out uh -huh. of the book so that mm -hmm. you're brought into the context of the book. And then after that, um, I'll start the conversation. We'll start and have a few uh, mm -hmm. chat about some of the themes that come out of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Malachi, would you uh, do the honours yeah. and read a little bit yeah. out, of the, out of the book? OK, the book is called Can Ireland Be One? Uh, like a lot of the books, it's written in the first person. It's, uh, it's, I would describe it as memoir-led. It draws on my own life and family experience and background uh, to raise questions about what it is to be Irish, how Irish am I, how Irish are any of us, how important is it that we should think of ourselves as Irish or call ourselves Irish. So it is a, it is a journey through the various, uh, ver it's a journey in part through history because, for instance, uh, there's um, one of the questions about Ireland and the sense of the Irish, the Irish sense of nationhood is how, when did it really become entirely distinct from a sense of British identity um, and so I look at things like the role of the Irish in empire, the role of the Irish in India uh, and in the, in the various wars um, and I look at culture and I look at the, 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 the cultures of nationalism and, and unionism and I come to uh, if you like the more um, systematically logical analysis of the thing with a chapter towards the end called why bother so having asked all these questions about what Irish identity is and where we belong and, and to what extent we need Irish identity to be expressed through statehood, then I, I say, well, you know, why bother? And so I'll read you that and, and I think it'll take about 
15 minutes. We'll see how it goes. The question we started with was, can Ireland be one? Let's try another. Why should Ireland be one? Throughout this book, we've heard a number of reasons. At the Ireland's Future debate in Cork, Tag Hickey articulated one of the strong historic arguments for unity. He said that the South had pulled up the drawbridge and condemned some of its own people to discrimination and the denial of their nationality. He went a bit further and said that the Irish in Northern Ireland were effectively stateless, which isn't an argument that has to be engaged with since it's not true. They are not wandering helplessly around a giant airport. They have a choice of two passports when those who are stateless have none. But it is true that a minority Catholic population in Northern Ireland felt detached from the nation to which it preferred to belong, and that as a minority in a Protestant state, it was disadvantaged and discriminated against. I don't think that sense of detachment is as strong as it was in my youth. We move freely around the island and are more contented in the north, for we are not demeaned or discriminated against as we once were. When I told a Sinn Féin supporter I thought we had less to complain about now, she, like Tag Hickey, brought up the horror of our being excluded in the North from RTE competitions. I doubt even she would go back to the barricades over that. Actually, one of the reasons you can't do these quizzes on RTE and uh, um, the Late Late, did you know, it's not because they're discriminating against the North, it's because the type of quiz they hold is illegal in the UK. It's, you know, <laughs> you know uh, which of the following is true? Malachi Udarty is male, Malachi Udarty is a Martian, Malachi Udarty was born in Timbuktu. You know, that's the way the, their, their quizzes go. So the answer is always, so it's really just a raffle. <laughs> Many Catholic, <laughs> Many Catholics such as my own family came to Northern Ireland to be better off, to have enhanced job prospects, free health care and better housing and welfare benefits. So the argument that we were ditched into conditions worse than those we would have known had we stayed in the Republic does not stand up. But even if it did, Northern Ireland's Catholics, Nationalists, Irish identifying people, whatever we call them, are no longer a vulnerable minority inside Northern Ireland. They can no longer be oppressed and discriminated against by a Protestant state. They do not need Ireland to be united in order to have their basic human rights restored to them. On the other hand, neither do Unionists need to be protected by a border against the grisly reach of a Catholic Church that no longer plays such a dominant role in Irish society. Some argue that Northern Ireland is a colony of Britain and needs to be restored to its rightful place as part of the Irish nation. Kevin Maher deploys this argument in his book, A United Ireland, Why Unification is Inevitable and How It Will Come About. But while Ireland may have been an unhappy member of a union, it was not a colony any more than Scotland today is a colony. Colonies don't send MPs to the mother parliament. One could argue that the fact that there is a majority in Northern Ireland in favour of staying in the UK is contrived, a product of an unjust partition. But that argument has been superseded by the Good Friday Agreement, which allows that uniting Ireland requires a majority vote in Northern Ireland. Both parts of Ireland have assented to that, as have the paramilitary organisations in the North, including the Provisional IRA. The British retain the right alone to call that vote, but a failure to do so when real prospects of success were obvious would face political outrage and legal challenge. Another reason for Irish unity is to remove the North for its own good from the United Kingdom, or British rule as Republicans call it. The Brexit vote reinforced that thinking. Northern Ireland as a whole suffers as a minority within the UK. A majority did not want to leave the EU. The assumption here is that Northerners would be happier with their affairs being debated in Dublin by TDs with a variety of Irish accents than they could ever be with decisions being made for them in London. British or English rule has been more acceptable at some times than at others. The original civil rights campaign, after all, was an appeal by Northern nationalists to the British government to insist that the Unionists govern to British standards of justice and democracy. Labour governments have usually been more considerate of Northern Irish concerns than Conservative governments. But an independent Scotland would leave Britain more solidly conservative and much less attractive 
to Northern Irish nationalist and middle ground voters. A variant of the argument that Ireland needs its freedom from England is that it needs to honour the sacrifices made in the past to achieve that freedom. Much of the Irish sense of national identity is founded on the narrative of that struggle. But a difficulty with that narrative is that honouring and preserving it may be incompatible with the unity of the people. The assertion of Ulster Protestant British identity is a refusal of that narrative as much as it was a refusal of the Catholic Church or Rome rule. So building a new Ireland according to the visions of past rebels would alienate the Protestant Unionist British identifying people who regarded those rebellions as attacks upon themselves and their vision of who they are. Neil Richmond and Jim Callaghan say, forget all that. Uniting Ireland is not about the past, but about the future. They say all sorts of creative accommodations may be possible to preserve the British identity of unionists. Sinn Féin's Mary Lou Macdonald herself seemed to go along with that to some extent in the Mansion House debate when she said that she wanted to honour the heroes of the past, but not to be bound by their vision. Sinn Féin has shifted focus many times, though it would probably be uncomfortable admitting to its serial apostasies. The party has adopted and discarded several different visions of a united Ireland, from Catholic to Socialist, inside and outside the EU, allied to Libya and to Irish America, its one constant being the unification of the island. Another argument for a united Ireland is that it would establish long-term peace. This was the view of Hubert Butler. He wanted Protestants in the South to see unity as being in their own interest and to agitate for it. It is the only vision of the future in which the old conflict is resolved, that is by a nationalist victory secured by demographic advantage and a democratic vote. This argument says there is no prospect of unionist victory or a stable accommodation. A unionist victory could only be one which somehow ends the agitation from nationalism for unity, and this cannot be done through repartition. Nor does the history of power sharing encourage faith in long-term, stable and creative government, though that all may change tomorrow apparently. <laughs> so why not a clear-cut answer to the Irish question in unification of the island, and those who don't like it can lump it or leave? Doug Beattie has said he would stay. Arlene Foster, a former leader of the DUP and First Minister, has said she would leave. The answer to this argument is that unification would not guarantee an end to sectarian tensions. These arose before partition, even before the Union, so there's no reason to suppose they would be settled once and for all by an end to either. That sense of victory being attainable through Irish unity may not just be pegged to a hope of bringing conflict to an end. Victory may be attractive precisely because it affronts and humiliates unionists. In a divided society, polarised communities seek to undermine each other. Indeed, it may be that some cling to the idea of a united Ireland or a sustained union with Britain for no more deeply considered reason than that the other community abhors it. One might argue that the future offers other prospective internal settlements that a majority of nationalists might be content with confident that discrimination and the eclipsing of their Irish identity will not return. Even ordinary majority rule in Northern Ireland, the system of government that produced discrimination in the past, might work better now, as it does in other divided societies, for both nationalism and unionism would have to compete for coalition with middle ground parties to get power, and that would prompt them to moderate rather than accentuate their differences and animosities. An argument for unity made by Gerry Adams and others is that both parts of Ireland were damaged by their confessional cultures in which full citizenship rights relied on membership of a religious denomination. So the merging of Northern Protestants and Southern Catholic states into one would have prevented the excesses of both. A stronger Protestant influence in the South would have restrained, restrained the state from delegating so much of education, healthcare and social services to abusive religious orders. On the other side, Protestants would not have been able, or perhaps even incentivized, to discriminate against Catholics, who being a larger proportion of the state than the Protestants in the Republic were, would have been better placed to assert their rights. This feels like a strong and attractive argument looking back, but like the argument for saving Northern Catholics from discrimination, it no longer applies. 
Catholic Church influence has already been curtailed in the Republic by secularization, while Protestant influence in the North has been diluted both by secularization and the loss of majority status. So again, a problem that unity might have solved has gone away anyway. From John Doyle, Neil Richmond and Jim O'Callaghan, we have heard the argument that a united Ireland would thrive economically. Their vision is that the old argument be set aside and that the simple pragmatic course is to merge the two parts of Ireland inside the European Union and invite further foreign investment. The first weakness in that argument is in the hope that the legacy of division can actually be set aside and that the unionists can be won over. That seems unlikely, though perhaps not impossible. If unity becomes inevitable anyway, through demographic shifts and strong campaigning leading up to a border poll. One may suppose that if unionists were to find themselves more prosperous in the new Ireland, they would more readily adapt to it. But the transition to a thriving all-Ireland economy built on inward investment will be slow and we would have to cut back the Northern Irish public sector before private enterprise was ready to employ all those discarded civil servants. Look at what happened in the northeast of England after Mrs Thatcher defeated the miners and heavy industry gave way, gave way to the emergence of a service economy. That was traumatic, not a gradual and stable evolution that looked after those who lost their jobs. Still, there were some who argued before the Brexit vote that leaving the EU was worth doing, even if it took 50 years for the new global Britain to establish itself. There have been many in the past who argued that similar sacrifices were warranted in the cause of a united Ireland. But it is hard to imagine that families who depend on public sector employment will vote themselves out of their safe jobs and pensions, even if the case is plain that a future more productive Ireland would be better off for their children than an Ireland of subsidised pen pushers and paper clip counters. In a united Ireland there would still be the option under the Good Friday Agreement of retaining Stormont, power being devolved from Dublin rather than London. But such devolution would be as vulnerable to one side walking out as the current arrangement has been. If Northern Nationalists decided that they did not want to share power with the Unionists, they could simply leave and let Dublin run everything. Yet power at local level is attractive. It creates jobs and provides influence and opportunity for parties to grow. So maybe nationalists would be happy with an estormant devolved from Dublin. Unionists have tried to make devolution work, more at some times than others, but they have needed it more than Sinn Féin has. The DUP base is smaller than Sinn Féin's. Without the Assembly, it has only a couple of council areas and a few seats in Westminster, whereas Sinn Féin has a major presence in the Dáil and the prospect of being in government there. Almost nobody is saying now that we should have Irish unity to preserve an ethnically distinct Irish state, though that is clearly what the founders of the Irish state wanted. My personal Irishness is not a single coherent thing. It emerges with the Scottishness and Englishness of my cousins and forebears. When I travel to Glasgow and Edinburgh, I feel as if I am still in my own neighbourhood, even finding those places more genial than some of the streets I walked through daily as a child. When I was in Ottawa at a book festival, I addressed an audience of people who'd come out of Belfast and Armagh and Derry for a better life. A woman came up to me afterwards and said her family was from the New Lodge Road. That road is on a sectarian interface. When I have been there, it has been to report on murder and rioting. She asked me, do you know it? Is it nice? <laughs> Seen from the air, from a distance to sight a foolish song, Ireland is an island that looks compact and green. This too easily leads to a kind of geographic determinism, the view that an island is a country and should be undivided. Tag Hickey was appalled as a child to see the north and south of Ireland marked in two different colours on the map. The injustice of partition is simply obvious to him, and often those who argue that Ireland should be a single self-governing nation state refer to the fact that we are surrounded by water, meaning that sovereignty has already been determined by the sea, its natural boundary. This thinking belongs to a time in which the sea divides rather than unites. Dublin is about as near to Liverpool as to Galway for a crow, indeed closer since the wind usually comes from the west. In the past, a boat moved more smoothly and faster than a horse-drawn carriage. The evolution of transport may have influenced our sense of nationhood as much as the songs about past wars. In Hesham in Lancashire, where the Belfast Ferry used to dock, there are the ruins of a church dedicated to St. Patrick, 
who is believed to have visited monks whose old stone graves nearby are now open to the wind and rain. It is doubtful that our patron saint had the same sense that we have of Ireland as a country apart. Ireland houses a meeting of two ethnic cultures and has done, has done for hundreds of years. Roughly we call them Catholic and Protestant or Unionist and Nationalist. And of course new cultures flow into the island from several continents. But it is this historic division that challenges the idea that Ireland can be one. Reconciliation between the centuries old cultures may be more difficult than between ourselves and the newer inflows. There is a mechanism agreed in the Good Friday Agreement for uniting the separate jurisdictions on the island of Ireland and lots of different arguments for why it should be done, but there is no sure route yet to uniting the people. So, I'm sorry, is that a bit longer? Thank you very much. Pleasure. Yeah. Um, as you said, it was, it was kind of memoir led. Yeah, yeah. Less so in that chapter. <laughs> no, but, yeah, yeah. but even still, there's always yeah. something about yourself wrestling through the, yeah. the pages of the book. Yeah. Would you describe yourself as Irish? Oh, yes, yeah, mostly. Yeah. I mean, when I lived in India for a time, I didn't, I, I was an Ingregi. Ingregi mm -hmm. is English. But that's simply because from that distance, most of the people that I met had no notion of a distinction between Ireland and England. And, and it would have taken five minutes to explain every time. But yes, uh, you know, here I'm Irish, yeah, absolutely. And so given that a lot of the book is kind of deconstructing all the different things which people think are Irish, yeah. and that's what you do very well, what are the things you would point to that would confirm that to you at this stage in your life? What makes you Irish? My birth certificate. Mm -hmm. I was born in Muff in County Donegal. Um, but I was born on the island of Ireland and, and I think another way of coming at this question is to say that I do not have an identity concern. Mm -hmm. I was talking to other people around this issue in another programme and one of them spoke of how she wrestled with her sense of identity yeah. and was working towards a sense of being Irish. Right? Mm -hmm. I have no difficulty with my sense of identity. I, it, it is no bother to me at all. I'm not working towards any sense of myself as being Irish or not Irish, mm -hmm. or, and I'm not, and I have no difficulty with the part of me that's British. My mother was born in Plymouth. My grandfather was in the Navy during the uh, First World War. Um, I watch uh, English television, read English novels. You know, I speak the English language. Yeah. And I think, actually, I speak it rather well. <laughs> we'll be the so, judge of that. <laughs> you know, but, uh, so, so, I, so it's just not a worry or a problem to me uh, to say that I'm Irish. It, it, it's a matter. I, I wonder if some people in Belfast who weren't born in the Republic confronted with the animosity towards Irishness that they encounter uh, actually feel more of a need to prove it because they weren't born on the other side of the border. I, at school, Brother Walsh once, when on one of those days at school, we had to bring in your birth certificate for something, you know, called me out to the front of the class and he held up my birth certificate with a harp on it. And he said, here's the only Irish man among you. The rest of you are West Brits. <laughs> now, he did do that. A Christian brother did do that. We were at school with Christian brothers who had come from Cork and Kerry, you know, and had these these accents that were not familiar to us. And part of their approach was to sneer at these West Belfast working class boys. You know, that was part of what they did, you know. And, and, and so there may have been an element of exacerbation in that, you know. I, I was once, uh, about 10 years ago, I was in America on St. Patrick's Day, mm -hmm. as half of the country seems to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was with Anna Lowe. Right. who at the time had just been elected to the Northern Ireland Assembly. Yeah. And one of the Irish Americans um, at the Ireland Funds dinner came up to her and they said, um, why are you here? You're not Irish. Yeah, yeah. To which yeah. she replied, yeah. why are you here? You're not Irish. Yeah. <laughs> and I, it made me wonder about what the, what, where do the boundaries of this concept lie? Yeah. Because I thought she very cleverly sa uh, yeah. summed something up there, yeah. which is, is Irishness a static concept? I think you use this term, yeah. lavish, affable, poetic and spiritual. I, I love that. These are the places where <laughs> <laughs> the Irish are lavish, affable, yeah. poetic and spiritual. Well, McNeese is another, <laughs> devout, profane and hard <laughs> for the Belfast ones. <laughs> and, and, and this sense yeah. that um, 
Anna, who has given her life to public service in this place, mm. is now saying, and actually got into trouble for saying she wanted to United Ireland. Yes, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. is, is, is considered to be kind of outside that pale. Does your concept of Irishness, therefore, is it a, is it a geography that's mobile or is it, a, is, is it how much of these old stereotypes of language, of the, of religion, of the history of struggle against Britain, how much of those are still important to tell, to maintain some sense of coherence and, or, or what sense, or can they be dropped now? I think they're essentially patronising. You know, I mean, I think the idea of the affable Paddy, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know is, is a bit of a lark, you know. Uh, I mean, I think that's just essentially patronising. I do think that there are Irish people who generate that, who promote it, you know. Even, uh, and I talk about uh, Ryan Tuberty on The Late Show, when they raise money for a charity, he will say something like, this is who we are, this is what we do. You know, essentially we are better than the rest of the world. We are a moral, spiritual people uh, with more of a conscience and more of a heart uh, than other people. And I think, uh, you know, I suppose all peoples, all nations have, do something like that. But I think, uh, I think that's... I think that's facile for him to say that. I think it's a little nonsense. Uh, it doesn't do a lot of harm. But I think this other thing that maybe comes more from England, you know, that, that, uh, that we are slightly primitive, in some sense a junior partner to England, you know, in, in the political sphere or in any other sphere. Um, I think that, that's, that's patronising and, 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 and hostile. And I think in some ways we have tried to counter that. You know, and I mean, I mean, you see this, you've seen this as well. And I mean, I'm thinking out loud here slightly riskily, but you've seen that in some degree in black culture, that black people patronized kind of respond with a wee bit of clownishness, you know, rather than to make the thing too contentious. And, uh, and I think maybe we Irish have done that as well, you know. Um, uh, but, but no, I think the, the, the Irish are as, we are a, a, a segment of the human race. We have a diaspora that covers every bit of the planet. Um, there is no genetic or biological reason why you would say that an Irish person is less intelligent, less handsome, uh, you know, less sexually alluring, you know, than, uh, than, than anyone from any other country in the world. So, so no, I don't think we should play on the idea of a distinctive Irish identity uh, that locates us as better or more interesting than people. But we do have an interesting culture and we, and we should be pleased to participate in that sh and share in that. You know? One of the uh, references you make in the book is to um, Benedict Anderson and Benedict Anderson is, is constantly communities. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, quoted in yeah, yeah. The academic circles. Benedict yeah, Anderson wrote yeah. a book called Imagined Communities where he says that the, uh, the nature of nations is as imagined communities. Yeah. Where, where is, is there anywhere where Ireland can go now to imagine itself as a single community? Uh, if uh, so, when yeah. does Ireland feel one? Yeah. Um, you ask the question is: Is Ireland mm. be one? But does yeah. Ireland need to feel one? Does Ireland need to imagine itself as one before it can be one? I mean, Desmond Fennell is quoted in the book saying, essentially, if I paraphrase it, uh, that um, the conception of the Irish nation was created in the nineteenth century. Uh, by Republicans, you know, and sacrifices were made for the creation of that nation. And out of, uh, and that is, that is what we owe allegiance to. That is what we have a duty in some way to preserve. And I say, well, no, actually, no, I don't accept that at all, you know. But can we tell a story about Ireland that, or do we even need to tell a story about an Ireland? We certainly need to undermine that story. Yeah. Because that's no use to us. That's obsolete. And it's still getting in the way. And we still have political structures which are built on that story. And, and, and they ultimately, I mean, ultimately we do not want, or I do not want uh, an ethnic Irish state. And I think political parties which ground themselves on ethnic factions, you know, are, are by implication promising us, promising us an ethnic state. And I don't want that here any more than I would want it in Israel or Tibet or wherever. It's just a bad idea for you organize a state. So do we have a story about ourselves? I, I, you know, I don't think we need a coherent story. I think we can have a, uh, possibly someday, and, and I'll decide 
how to vote when the time comes, not now, but it is conceivable that you would have an all-island administration, you know, with, uh, with a, a healthy democracy and a healthy economy and, and a sense of, of what we're doing for the best for all of us living here and to create good relations with other countries in the world. I, I would hope that would all come about. I don't think we need an overarching myth that says uh, we are the land of saints and scholars or we're the land of Patrick Pierce, or we're the republic that was declared on the steps of the GPO. I think all that is hokum. It's interesting because um, the title of the book, um, Can Ireland Be One? is at one level, uh, you know, takes you into a conversation that's mm. very alive and has been alive, I suppose, but is particularly alive in the last while. Yeah. But it's different from Can Ireland Be United? Yeah. And I'm, yeah. I'm wondering whether the language that we use around United Kingdom, United Ireland, is a language which takes you back to a conversation which is about still winning an old war, yeah. Yeah. Uh, rather than a question of whether you, it takes you forward to yeah. what is the island we're going to share, or what it, can yeah. Ireland be one yeah. or two, or whatever you yeah. ask in the question, some yeah. of the one of the chapters. Yeah. But I suppose is, does language in this conversation matter? Because sometimes I, I think people, the, the ownership of the concepts, United Ireland, United Kingdom, is so fixed and so politicised now right, that yeah. it's quite difficult to move yourself past the, the binary of those two yeah, things. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, I think when I'm talking, can Ireland be one? I'm saying, essentially, can Ireland be at peace yes. among the people who live on the island? You know, and and even if so, it's it's something to do with almost John Hume. It's United people. Our United people. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I was at a. There's a there's a con there's a I was at a conference in the south where, where there was a lot of conversation about the reunification of Ireland, and I was thinking that's an interesting concept <laughs> to me yeah, because yeah. I'm not sure what the re is going back to. Yeah, yeah. re has something to do with repeating, mm -hmm. and I uh, and that's different to me from talking about a new Ireland. Yeah, which is yeah, a, a slightly yeah. different concept, yeah. a different exploration yeah. uh, tableau on which to yeah. spit, and means that everybody's going to have to shift. But yeah. part of me wonders whether. The, the story of the South has now become yeah, the uh, ossified in a certain way. Yeah. I mean, O'Donovan Russell wanted the British out and lands restored to the Gaelic Lords. He wanted them all called back from wherever they were in Spain or Flanders, you know, you know and, and given, give, give Tyrone back to O'Neill, you know, a nonsensical idea. Um, there this isn't idea. an Ireland to reunify, there isn't a place to go back to. Like the song, Once Upon a Time There Was Ireland's Ways and Ireland's Laws. Yeah. You know, that's, that's more of that mythologising. But the mythologising is very strongly endorsed still. I mean, in uh, last August, Leo Varadkar and Micheál Martin uh, went to Belle Nabla to commemorate Michael Collins. You know, one of the founders of the nation. You know, they, you know, they, we are still, we still have our story about our martyrs. We still have our story about the noble freedom struggle, and we still have a sense that there was a result out of that that is unfinished business, and that the logic of uniting Ireland is for finishing that business. You know, there. Are, um, I want to bring everybody else yeah. here in a, in a second, but I, there's a couple of things I want to ask you about. Um, reading about, uh, in, in a sense, uh, the the the. I was reading about de Valera and about 1932 and the Eucharistic Congress yeah, yeah. in Dublin, yeah. in which all of the literature talks about Ireland as a spiritual superpower yeah, because yeah. it's opposed to materialistic yeah. England, which yeah. is a empire, yeah, empire yeah. but Ireland is a, a spiritual superpower. Yeah. And it's very Catholic and it's dancing at the crossroads and it's de Valera arriving yeah. in power and taking over the southern state. And I wonder in this time of Brexit, we, we, we're at Brexit where people say people were sold a false prospectus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and looking at modern Ireland now and saying, you know, very few people would recognise, as you make very clear in the book, yeah. the, that kind of Ireland. Yeah. Um, do we know what we're doing when we're voting for these things or are we essentially voting for... Um, we, we, we have to, we, you go on an independent journey here that, uh, that, that there won't be any, yeah. we won't get what we want in the end either. These are all imaginations. I think in some ways we're voting on identity. I mean, if you challenge me on why I voted against Brexit, yes. I would not be able to build up the economic argument. Mm -hmm. I don't have that expertise. You know, at, at some level, yes, I read about it and thought about it and talked to others, but at some fundamental level, it was, it was an expression of identity. You know, 
And, and I admit that, and I admit that I did that without the fullest possible information, because I don't have a head that can t could contain the information that I would need. So I suppose when people, uh, you know, when people, for instance, in uh, every 50 years or so commemorate 1916, you know, and, and Pierce and, and the Declaration of the Republic, will they not admit to themselves that this isn't, the, or even the South, and none of it is the, is the Republic that was envisaged by Pierce? You know, what he envisaged was an ethnic Catholic state. You know, his appeal to the Protestants in the North to join in that ethnic Catholic state was not, you know, to say, you can be totally free and British and part of us. It was to say, you are living in error. And if you can grow out of that error, you can join with us and be part of our ethnic Catholic Gaelic state. But yeah, they, they said that when the state was established in 1921, um, 22, uh, you know, they thought that by making Irish the official language of the state, and to making it compulsory in the schools, then within a single generation we would have an Irish-speaking country, you know. As Joe Lee said about uh, De Valera, you know, he thought he only had to look into his heart to see what the Irish people wanted. <laughs> so, and he looked there and saw they wanted sugar beet, <laughs> you know. So, so you could have protectionist agriculture, you know, and block all imports because Ireland could be, could be and the women would be at home at the kitchen, you know, getting a meal ready for the farmer coming back with his it's like a sugar beet over his whole shoulder, yeah. you know. I mean, it, it was all fanciful nonsense. And yet, you know, uh, if we are to have a united Ireland, if we're going to go into the border poll, Ireland, the Republic, the South, is going to have to examine its conscience about that stuff, you know. And, and, and it is and has come an awful long way in terms of decatholicizing, although it's got a lot further to go on that. But it's going to have to say, you know, uh, Tonight we man the barn a whale, are you sure? You know, an octahems of barn a whale, you know? Mm -hmm. Maybe not, you know? Maybe we let that all go as well, you know? We, um, uh, actually in the, in the part you read, you talked about how the agreement in many ways mm -hmm. uh, has changed any notion of no statehood. You've got two passports rather than one. Yeah. You can move more freely. Yeah. To what extent do you think the Brexit conversation and what has happened in the last six years has changed this conversation. Do you think that it has had a, a, um, an impact on the, uh, making this question more open again? Or do you think that in the end sectarianism and the, and the divisions that we have just divide us back into, the, into those two groups? I think there was a sense of shock after the Brexit vote was carried. I mean, on that day, I was over at the American consul for one of their parties. It was for the 4th of July. It wasn't the 4th of July, but it was an advance event. It was a great party. And David Trimble was there. Uh, lots of DUP people were there. STLP people were there. Mike Nesbitt was there. And the conversation was in a state of hushed shock, you know. And a sense among my sense was, you've, you've just blown it, you know. <laughs> you know this, it's now going to be United Ireland. You know, uh, there was, I, I had a sense that there was some kind of compact between nationalism and unionism that, that you know, uh, unionism uh, would have its Britishness, uh, but, but, you know, nationalism would allow that in a sense if it wasn't affronted on the same scale as it was by, by the Brexit vote. So, I, so now there was a possibility, I felt it over the years since, that that, was, that feeling was waning, that people who in 2016 would have said, hang on, you know, we're definitely on our way to United Ireland now. And a lot of those people would, you know, eh, you never know, oh, well, let's see how it goes, you know, would have softened their attitude, the shock would have subsided. And that is what has happened in Ireland so many times, is that shocks subside. But I mean, if we're going into a situation tomorrow, which is mm -hmm. what's forecast, uh, where the thing breaks again, where we don't get the protocol sorted out and don't get the restoration of Stormont, then a lot of people are going to say, well, what's the point in Stormont? You know, what's, what's the point in even worrying about it or trying to have it, bring it back now? Let's just be done with it. And, and, and the logical uh, course of action then is, is towards the greater uh, drift towards, uh, towards Dublin and the unification of Ireland. A lot of people think that way. There's a, a very interesting conversation in, in the book with Colin Harvey and Ireland's and discussion about Ireland's future yeah, and yeah, your yeah. Um, I take the mickey out of them a bit, but that's okay. Yeah, isn't you it? do. You know? <laughs> but one of the, one of the things you say is, you know, you, you, there's, uh, like a lot of these things, there's so many things in the book which are kind of 
tales which you could actually explore even further because I think it's, that's what makes the book so interesting. You Thank throw you up so much, many yeah. ideas. Yeah. But one of them is, you know, Ireland might be united by agreement or it might be united eventually by demographic advantage yeah. and just you don't need them anymore so you yeah. get a majority. Yeah. Does that matter? It matters hugely. It matters hugely because the Protestant, the Protestants of the of the twenty six county state, the free state, assimilated. You know, they assimilated reasonably well. They knew that they were disadvantaged within that, but then again, they were a fairly prosperous class within it. So they so they were going to manage all right. And the, Hubert Butler tells the story, and I quote it in the book, of the wee woman who doesn't want to rock the boat. And sure, if she wants to read dirty books, she can go to England and get them there, and and there's no problem. That would not be replicated in a united Ireland carried by demographic advantage, leaving a Protestant uh, minority disgruntled. Because the Protestant minority we would have now would be very different. First of all, it would be, it has territorial boundaries. It would be Antrim and Down, essentially, and a bit of, of Derry, you know, and, and, and a bit of Fermanagh. So it would North be, Arma. and North Armagh. So it would be an enclave. Yeah. It would be an enclave. It would be the, it would be the Donetsk of Ireland. Right, yeah. right. So it would not be, it would, and it would not be a happy enclave. And as a minority, it would have the power, as previous minorities have shown, to be a major irritant within the management of the state. Right, and the danger. So it would retain its councils with its unionist representation, its flags and emblems. It would reject Irish language education in schools. It would reject uh, the Irish flag, it would, and it would reject uh, the symbols of Irishness within the state. It would probably reject the new police force, if there was a new All-Ireland police force. It would agitate for the continuation of the PSNI. Uh, it would potentially call Protestants from outlying areas back into the enclave to consolidate it further. It would be the biggest headache imaginable for the Irish state if you were to have essentially a, a, a disgruntled Protestant or British identifying enclave within the island of Ireland. Even if you, if you go reject the idea of the million dissatisfied Protestants and let it be just half that number and you would still be talking about 10% of the, of the new Irish nation and that 10% of the Irish would be bigger than any other uh, minority faction like uh, uh, like the gays or 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 or, or, eth or other ethnic groups. So it, it would no the a United Ireland that did not that that was sprung on that group of people entirely against its will uh, would still retain the problems of sectarian division uh, and unrest because sectarian division precedes partition, precedes the union, and will last beyond it. In Scotland, one of the things I did for some work for the Scottish government on sectarianism, and the, one of the things that's interesting is that it seems to me that they t still try to treat it as something specifically religious. Yeah, yeah. But religion has definitely faded on the terraces of Ibrox and yeah. Parkhead. Yeah. And at the same time, sectarianism has not. Yeah. So it's this thing something. that goes by the name yeah. sectarianism, which kind of yeah. draws your attention to its religious dimension. Yeah. It's maybe a mistake that really it's the conflict between these groups which has become yeah. very deeply embedded yeah. and that by which people define themselves. Yeah. And that, that conflict itself is almost bigger than the causes. It's almost yeah. outlasted yeah. the causes. Yeah. Yeah. And actually still talking about it as religious just in order yeah. to keep it in a box yeah. doesn't really work. No. It was religious in my father's day, mm -hmm. you know. And was, unionism was fundamentally religious and I suppose the great exponent of that was Ian Paisley, you know. Um, but we have a secularising within the Protestant community. We now, have the, we now have the anomaly, for instance, that the Catholic parties are agitating for the full implementation of abortion law reform, you know, whereas Catholicism regards support for abortion as grounds for instant excommunication. You don't even need to involve a bishop. You do it yourself. You know? It's the one thing. You know, so, so we have that. So the, it is no longer about religion entirely. It's still in there, yeah. right? But... But there's been this incredible resilience of those uh, communal factions uh, beyond the religious roots that, that created them. And that is quite extraordinary. Now, what preserves it in, uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, which is different from Scotland, and Scotland I would defer to you on, but what preserves it in Northern Ireland is territorial division, political parties which, I, uh, which organise within those, those territories, um, uh, so you can throw a dart at a map of, our, of Belfast and it'll land in a Protestant street or a Catholic street, you know, 
with very few exceptions. Um, what, what, so we, then we have uh, the segregated school system. We have an anomaly in that we have the decline of Catholicism, but we don't have the decline of a Catholic education system. The Catholic education system should not be entitled to claim the right to educate virtually more than half the children of, 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 of Northern Ireland, because most of those children don't, don't go to mass. They're not practicing Catholics. I mean, there was an interesting story uh, in St. Dominic's, for instance, when uh, the, uh, the school, the Board of Governors ruled that the, the amnesty group in St. Dominic's had to disband because amnesty was pro-life. And the girls went to visit to the headmistress's office and says, but we're not Catholics, you know? You know? It's, just, it's fantastic development, you know, terrific development. So essentially, you, you know, uh, we've got the territorial division, we've got the religious division, we've got division in sport, we've division in our morning newspapers. You know, I mean, take the Irish news and newsletter for any week and look at their political coverage, their sports coverage, and you'll find areas where they do not overlap at all. There's a Venn diagram there, but there's a very clear uh, Catholic, whatever that word now means, interest, and a clear Protestant, whatever that word means, interest, and a separation. So we have got an institutionalized separation that runs through the whole thing, generated probably most of all by the territorial division and the division of political parties. Politi Sinn Féin and the SDLP almost exclusively organized politically among people who were baptized Catholic and educated in Catholic schools. And the Protestant parties, the Ulster Unionists and the Democratic Unionist Party similarly organize only among people who were baptized in Protestant churches and went to state or Protestant schools. Now, and neither of them is saying this is a calamity for us. Neither of them is saying this should not be. Neither of them would say this is an embarrassment to us on the world stage, let alone in the British stage. You know, they don't, they don't own that disgrace. They don't own that scandal. They don't own that sectarianism. Mm -hmm. And yet it is fundamental to all of them. I, I, I would add also that mm -hmm. if you've had years of violence along those lines, yeah. it probably reinforces a lot of those yeah, things of course, as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm looking at our visitors and guests and seeing if there's anybody who would have a question that they would like to ask or a, a direction. There's people at the back who have um, microphones. So if anybody has a question, has anybody got a question they would like to put to Maliki or a point they would like to make uh, to Maliki at, at this point? Yeah, I mean, when you were talking about nationalists, you know, uh, national identity. Yeah. You know, I often wonder, that 25 years after the Good Friday Agreement, society as it was then, is just not comparable to what it is now in terms of the mix of cultures and different minority ethnic yeah, backgrounds. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and we're given choices, you're British, you're Irish, you're Ulster Scots. Mm. I think European has kind of slipped off the agenda. <laughs> you speak of in that identity as well. Mm. But I wonder, and this is across the whole island, you would have like second, third, fourth and more generations. We've had minority ethnic citizens here for centuries. Yeah. So they still would have the uh, origins from their parents and grandparents in other countries. Hmm. Um, I wonder if you opened it up to say you're British, Chinese, Irish, Asian. You know, what would that look like in terms of the all Ireland approach? Hmm. We're looking at two, the two main traditions, if you like, but we're now a region of minorities yeah. and they have a voice and yeah. they're entitled to a voice. And it sounds different. Yeah, Amanola de Sande is in the book because he was at one of the Ireland's Future uh, meetings, you know, and he said very, uh, he's very, a cork, uh, he's a, a professor of religion, I believe, at Cork University, you know, and he says, he said, because you're so fixated in this stuff in Ireland, you don't allow me to be Irish. I mean, he actually grew up in Scotland. There's a wonderful photograph of him on Twitter with his Pakistani mother and father in their Pakistani gear. And he's wearing a kilt, you know, and it's great, you know. And uh, but at the same time, he's saying, um, you know, that um, uh, I am not really allowed to be Irish here in the way that I was uh, Scottish in Scotland. Uh, we were at a festival in Scotland just a year or two ago, and there was a discussion on the Scottish legacy of slavery, and black Scottish people were standing up and saying, "We, you know, we Scots." have a responsibility to, to put this right, right? You know, it, it, it would be, it, 
a lot of virus people do wince at the sight of, well, Anna Lowe, yeah. you know, what right have you to be here? You're not Irish, you know. So we definitely have to get our heads around that one. But there's another possibility, Dimna, and the possibility is that we will advertise our magnanimity by being inclusive of uh, the new Irish, while at the same time retaining our animosity towards each other. And you see that, you know. Yep. And both are available. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and visible. Yeah. Any more? Yep, in the back there. I'd be interested, Maliki, for your views on something that kind of wasn't touched on there, was, which is the idea of a Northern Irish identity and to yeah. what extent you see that as a, a, a thing that is actually of substance or a positive thing. Sometimes when I, I look at that concept quite cynically, I, I see it as a, a sort of a negative concept that people retreat into, um, but quite understandably retreat into when the sort of narrow Irishness that you've discussed the, of Padraig Pierce and the Catholic yeah. Church is kind of imposed upon them and equally yeah. a narrow vision of Britishness is imposed upon them. Do you think that's what Northern Irishness primarily is an as an identity or is there kind of more to it than that and is it kind of growing into something more substantial? Be interested for John that. Gary did research and he broke down the elements of the Northern Irish identity or the different reasons and I suppose one of the reasons people say they're Northern Irish is they don't want to say I am Tig or I am Prod, you know, so it's a it's a, an identifier that appeals in the middle ground and that's good, that's fine by me, I mean that is the middle ground growing uh, I think we, our only hope is the middle ground, you know. I mean, I have, you know, a Republican who says I am a Republican and is only interested in getting votes from people who are educated Catholic is not a Republican. A Unionist who says he's British and is only interested in getting votes from people who are Protestant is not British. Not, not remotely reflecting the, the, the values of modern Britain and, it, and it's the multiplicity of, of identities and races and cultures that are included there, right? So. So we do need something in the middle which, which calls the others out. And if at least isn't calling them out, as, is at least creating some space for people who don't want to be part of, of that. I mean, you don't like the word sectarian, and I've been using it maybe lazily. Um, uh, and, and it maybe should be communitarian or identitarian or whatever. You know. But essentially, I do think that uh, politics shouldn't be about ethnic identity shouldn't have anything to do with it. I do not need a state to represent my Irishness, you know, any more than I need a state to represent my, my interest in Bob Dylan, you know. I just, I just don't, you know. I need a state that I can, to which I can elect representatives who will serve my practical interests and, and develop the smooth running of the country and develop good relations within the country and beyond it. That's what I need, you know. Um, so I think the very idea, so the idea of saying I am Northern Irish, I don't ever hear it being said in an assertive, aggressive way, you know. I hear I am British, you know, some, from somebody thumping the table, or I am Irish and thumping the table. I don't hear the guy who says I'm Northern Irish thumping the table. So I give him a Bible that I wouldn't give to the others. There's a, there's a for me personally, I, I totally identify with your idea mm. that no state can ever sum you up. So yeah. in the end of the day, yeah. uh, you have to live across the boundaries that you live across. Yeah. The, um, but there's something about a, a paradox in Northern Irishness, which is that it's a very weak identity, mm -hmm. the, but it's a very strong experience. And that has to be to do with being isolated out of the experiences of the things that it wishes to join. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's, a, it's an extremely different experience to the experience of Irishness and Britishness as experienced outside itself. Yeah. So it makes a massive impact. So there's something very, very strange about that, something which is received in that. Any more questions? Yep, Alan, the front. Yep, well, there's somebody at the back. Yes, go ahead. Hi. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed uh, that uh, conversation, that presentation. Thank you very I, much. Thank you. I, I really, really liked when you said, can Ireland be at peace? You know, and that should be the thing that we should be aiming for. Yeah. You know, uh, a united people is something that we should all be striving towards. Um, there are lots of narratives on this island, mm. uh, and absolutely even within Northern Ireland, there are lots of narratives about where, what is history and, you know, what is, um, what, are, what are the past and what if people have 
had over the last 100 years together. And we have had 100 years together, and I think that makes us um, a people in itself almost. You know, mm -hmm. we have a shared history, mm -hmm. not all of it very pleasant. In mm -hmm. fact, a lot of it very, very sad. But it is a shared history. We've had 100 years here together. Um, and just as you said about the Northern Irish identity, I consider myself Northern Irish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, very good. <laughs> I mean, what, you know, I also, I mean, and this started with Duncan asking me if I'm Irish, and I am Irish, but by virtue of being Irish, I am a token tig, a castle Catholic, a West <laughs> Brit, and a super, all rolled into one. <laughs> if you read my Twitter feed, that, you know, that's what I'm getting constantly. This, uh, this, this, well, yeah, <laughs> you know, this barrage of insults, right. you know, they, they, they tell me I'm a traitor to, to, my, to my birthright, you know. Um, so this is a problem, you know. This I is like, a problem. I liked your phrase describing those kind of twitters as hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did have a question. I just wanted to follow up on. Um, we're, we're all very aware of how the Good Friday Agreement protects the Irish and the British nationalities within the Good Friday Agreement. You know, if you're born in Northern Ireland, you can be Irish, you can be British, and you can be both. How do you think that that would extend in a united Ireland? Would you still be able to be British in the United Ireland? Um, I noticed on Twitter this morning. I don't know. I don't know if anybody's seen it. There was a young uh, a young man who's part of the Orange Lodge in Dublin, and he'd put himself up saying, I'm, "I'm in the Orange Lodge here in Dublin, and you know it's great." How would a British identity be seen to be progressed within a United Ireland? A lot of it would depend on whether it was uh, formally and generously assimilated at the point of unification. Um, I mean, I know I've spoken to people like uh, Neil Richmond, you know, who say very clearly that he wants British to have a British identity and even uh, perhaps a British driving license, you know, a British passport. But I mean, how far could that go? You couldn't extend it to, you know, you're Irish, so you pay your taxes to Dublin and you're British, so you pay yours to London. I, you know, I, I, ultimately, I think, yeah. I think, you, you know, you will, you, if you're a citizen of, of Ireland, whether the new Ireland, You'll be Irish for the sake of, you know, your formal relationship with the state. You know, you can identify yourself however you like in terms of culture, the richer the better. But, um, but, uh, but he is pursuing those ideas. Jim Callaghan also in Fianna Fáil is pursuing those ideas and publishing papers and promotion of those ideas. I'm just not entirely sure how they work, you know. The, um, theoretically, they might yeah. work the same way as they work now, which is you have an Irish passport, mm. but you have to pay your taxes in the British state. Yeah. Um, and that it would be the other way around. You can carry it, but as long as you're a resident, you have to pay your taxes in an Irish state. But that's just yeah. a theoretical starting yeah. point. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. How, how would you respond uh, to the, the argument, which I've often heard, that we might avoid uh, the disaster that was Brexit, in that you had to vote for Brexit before anyone quite knew what Brexit actually meant. Yeah. And that the best way to avoid a sort of similar disaster uh, with a Brexit poll, with a, sorry, with a border poll in Ireland, would be to set and train a series, say, of citizen assemblies yeah. in order to thoughtfully, as you have today, thoughtfully consider and reconsider all the possibilities consequent upon uh, a vote for unification or reunification. Yeah. Personally, I'd be happy with that. I, I would anticipate that unionists would not be happy with it and would not participate. But, you know... There, would there be any point in it, really, if the unionists refused to participate? There wouldn't in the first instance. You know, there wouldn't really. The, the, well, there might be my, some self-reflection by the Irish. And, but might there be a difference in the Citizens' Assembly, which is, on your question, which is, can Ireland be one, mm. to a different question from... How is Ireland going to be one? In mm. other words, mm. the, the Citizens' Assembly, which asks the question, can Ireland be one, opens up a, a whole series of options, of, yeah. of, including the possibility, which is well, no. In the, sense <laughs> the, the words from Bob Marks, I thought it depends very much on how such a proposal is framed. Yeah. Now, thus far, all these assemblies, uh, they're here or in, principally in Dublin or Cork, have uh, led in a sense, as you know, with the premise that a, a united Ireland is a good thing and, and inevitable. Is inevitable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if you started again, scrap all that and said, using the, the title of your book, why yeah. don't we have a series of citizens' assemblies saying, is it, would it be a good idea to unite Ireland? Or even, yeah. would it be a good idea simply to remain within the United Kingdom? The problem is, 
the, the momentum is moving yeah. towards a border poll and a decision, right? So, and in advance of that border poll, first of all, the, now somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. Do some think, do you think I'm wrong? The decision to call a border poll will have to be taken by the Secretary of State when it appears, when there is evidence that it would be carried, right? Immediately, right? And if, you know, if we had that evidence tomorrow and the border poll wasn't called straight away, you would have judicial reviews of the whole procedure and, and demand that it would, go, it would go to the Supreme Court. So once you reach that point, then the poll has to be called. Before you reach that point, then you need to do the preparation, right? So there has to be some kind of preparation or discussion. If that is intergovernmental talks in secret, like the lead up to the Anglo-Irish Agreement of 85, and if the unionists were to get wind of such talks happening, then they would go spare, right? The other thing that is likely to happen is that if uh, Sinn Féin get into government in the South, which is highly likely, not certain, but highly likely uh, after the next general election there, they will undoubtedly set up those assemblies. And they may indeed uh, uh, appoint a minister for unification. It's another idea that has been aired at the Ireland's Future Things. So the danger is that the trauma ahead is not the day of decision. The trauma ahead is the run up to the decision. It's, it's kind of echoes John Carson in the book, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. One last question from Alan. <clears throat> Hope to make it a good one. I'll start on a light note, Malachi. When you're talking about the RTE contest, I was in uh, the South over Christmas time, and one of these qu RTE quizzes came up. I said, where does Santa Claus come from? North Carolina, the North Pole, or Northern Ireland? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't screenshot it in time. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about, Malika, when you're discussing um, about how bad things could go with, um, say, a recalcitrant mm. loyalist, unionist mm. minority here, my heart sank a little bit because it reminds me of Kosovo and what I see yeah. in the northern part of Kosovo yeah. where in my opinion, things have gotten worse in the past 10 years because yeah. the costs of our government has got, looked more Albanian, it's gone ethnic Albanian more than trying to reconcile a, a Serbian minority. Mm -hmm. So my question then is, in order to say, forestall such thinking um, in the Southern political class, particularly if a border poll is inevitable, it's, I mean, it is inevitable, it's written down, it's gonna happen, is what, in your opinion, would uh, some of the, the Southern political class have to consider um, in regards to what can prick their consciousness. I'm thinking of Conor Cruz O'Brien. I'm just thinking of Southern, Southern, Southern political class where they realize that the day after any border poll is gonna be different than any life they've known before. So what are you asking me what they need to do to prepare for that moment? The trauma. <laughs> I don't know, I think they have to uh... I think they have to talk to the unionists, they have to get to know, they have to come up and meet us <laughs> and meet unionists. They have, to, they have to start thinking seriously about the things that they really would have to change, that they seem highly resistant to changing at the moment, like the flag, the national anthem, but the whole kind of national mythology grounded on the Easter Rising and the War of Independence, all of that comes into question, you know, and they may not be able to face that. Now you end up with the possibility that when they do face that, they vote against it. We vote for it. And they vote against it. And then what have you got? Cyprus. 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 <laughs> you, know, you, know, you certainly have the greatest trauma that nationalism has ever confronted. You know, far worse than partition. You know. So uh, maybe at the core of this question, whether a new Ireland or an Ireland that's just a reunified story coming yeah. from the south is yeah. really important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, you think that if the if 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 the South votes for United Ireland and we don't quite make it, we get another vote in seven years. But that's not what happens if we vote for it and the South votes against it. That's the end of the matter. There's no seven year provision in the Good Friday Agreement for that. You know? What we have to face up to is the fact that this society was divided 400 years ago and that the union and partition were irritants along the way, but they're not the fundamental problem the division is. You, you answer your question in the book, can Ireland be one? Yes, but it's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you wish it? No, 
No, not really. No, I don't wish it. No, no. I mean, I don't know where we'll be in 10 years from now. We could be in a totally buggered UK outside the European Union. And by then I might very strongly wish it. I do think, you know, that all things being equal, which they're not, having the option is, is a freedom that's not extended, for instance, not to Scotland. Scotland wants to have a vote on it and can be forbidden for doing it. We can't. If we, if we've got a, if we had the conditions that Scotland has today, the, we could not be refused to vote, you know. So we have, we have a latitude. But, I mean, the danger is that, that all the discussion leading to that and the event itself in the context of, of our division could be traumatic and violent. But, you know, aside from that, actually, it's quite, you know, you know, I've, I've got a freedom to make a decision. Maybe I'll be 90, <laughs> but still and all, you know. <laughs> 1690. <laughs> um, listen, Malachi, I think this has been a really interesting conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, congratulations on the book. I yeah. think it is, for anybody who hasn't yet read it, a very stimulating book. It is, as yeah. I say, it, it asks many questions and forces people to think through some of the contradictions and some of the yeah, complexities. Um, and because it is memoir, I think it invites people to reflect on their own position within it and some yeah. of the contradictions from a perspective of, of yeah. our own personal experiences. Yeah. And encourages us to know that this is, a, this is going to be a complicated emotional experience for people uh, from whichever background they're coming from because things yeah. are going to be touched, which are yeah. really interesting. So um, from this festival's point of view, I think it's been a really good opportunity to have a chance to highlight the book. And thank congratulations you and thank you for today. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.